or ball in Arabic tabi in his throat whenever he became nervous. Amjad had un undergone many medical tests to establish treatment for what he felt was a medical condition, though each medical consultation indicated that his throat was 100% normal. After a year, one of Amjad's physicians suggested that he seek help from a psychologist. Amjad was initially very embarrassed in the clinical space and found difficulty speaking about himself as well as anything beyond what he continued to feel must be a medical condition. I just wanna check in, can everybody hear? Cause I see a little bit of static and freezing on your end. Okay, that might, might just be me then. Back to Amjad. So he explained that there were days when he felt the ball in his throat was getting bigger while other days he felt it get smaller. Yad asked him to share with her his reflections and observations about what sometimes made the pain increase to such a degree that he was barely able to speak. He often entered her room with a shy smile and initially waited for her to start speaking. She characterized him as someone who took great care in arranging his sentences and words to make himself understandable. Yad indicated that he would often display great difficulty producing utterances, often experiencing word finding difficulties and showed signs of obsessiveness in searching for what she called correct phrasings. She reported that as a result, early in their sessions, Amjad mumbled very short sentences, speaking in choppy words and broken phrases. He would tell her, quote, my words stop in my throat. They nod up and become a ball in my throat. They suffocate me when they do not come out, end quote. Amjad was annoyed with himself and Yuad felt it too, counter-transferentially. She also often felt the ball move from his throat into her stomach and not she could not release. Amjad's therapy with Yuad spanned approximately a year and a half of weekly sessions. She reported initially having been supervised as in the case we heard from Ali that Stephen presented by an Israeli Jewish psychologist. Yuad noted, actually an analyst, Yuad noted that while the lore of the institution was such that everyone held themselves to professional standards and believed in the fundamental premise of psychoanalytic theory and practice, she often sensed this collapse of psychic space when her Israeli supervisors, especially in the case of Amjad, tried to theorize Palestinian patients seen by Palestinian clinicians. In the case of Amjad, rather than being curious about the psychoanalytic meanings of Amjad's symptoms, the supervisor insisted that Amjad suffered from an anxiety disorder and that only medication could solve his problem. Yad felt deeply conflicted by this assessment as she relayed her gut feeling, or what we might read as attuned clinical intuition, that Amjad likely had much more to say. She feared that medicine would potentially preemptively shut Amjad and his exploratory process down and foreclose opportunities to collaboratively read the symptoms as signs of a deeper communication about his experience and being. So as you can see, Yuad was a very well-trained psychoanalytic clinician. Yuad recalled disagreeing with her supervisor openly, despite being painfully aware of the power differential and the potential implications of doing so. She insisted she could continue to be curious with Amjad about what he was trying to communicate in the displacement, in the counter-transferential space, and in the dyad, even if this was not explicitly articulated. This, of course, represented an alignment with the psychoanalytic tradition and technique in which she and her supervisor were trained. Despite this, her supervisor insisted on psychiatric intervention, and therefore Yad suggested that he consult a psychiatrist an intervention that ultimately pacified her supervisor, but which Amjad refused. Despite refusing medication, or perhaps because, Yad noted that Amjad went from barely speaking to exquisite detailing of his many concerns, his fatigue from work, thoughts about his children, concerns regarding the relationship with his wife, struggles of travel through checkpoints, and his relationship with his brothers. Yad felt confused about the purpose of these details. She understood their literal meaning, but often found herself affectively discombobulated, wondering what he needed from her. She also came to feel suffocated in her words. She reported feeling frustrated as though Amjad had escaped from previous silences into speaking so much that no room was left even for breathing. As such, she often had the feeling of the room being heavy with thoughts and words that were left unsaid though they were very much present. 
In this, she reflected how both silence and speech can be defensive, used to fill up the space, but never reaching the depths of the patient or the clinician. While Yad was committed to and engaged in an intensive self-reflection of the work, she reported that her Israeli supervisor often downplayed her approach and considered her surface work with Amjad as a great success because Amjad had become comfortable with her. Her supervisor dismissed concerns about Yad's countertransference and was not curious about Yad's feeling that Amjad was, quote, making a lot of noise with no depth. Yad was especially concerned as the ball in his throat lightened as he spoke, but immediately returned and grew whenever the session ended. She felt that she and Amjad were playing a game of negotiation, and yet in reality, there was no solution. Yad often was confronted with conflicts regarding how to speak about the work with Amjad and supervision. She noted the psychoanalytic importance of having associated to negotiations, especially in the context of Palestine. While she understood intuitively that associations had meaning, especially in the countertransference, Yad found herself at a loss of how to express this concern to her supervisor, especially as the supervisor consistently did not share Yad's concerns. Amjad himself was happy that he did not feel any discomfort in his throat during the sessions. However, he stated that outside the clinic, his painful feelings returned and he was unable to get rid of the ball. Yad noted that this was an important turning point in treatment as it opened up a space for her to ask him about breathing in real time without being bogged down only by talking. More specifically, Yad said that with this opening in the material, she'd asked him to put aside the distracting notes he had taken to bringing into session and talk about his difficulty breathing with specific focus on when he was feeling suffocated. While he did not answer her directly at that time, Yad shared that he was smiling in his silence, and she felt it was important to self-disclose in service of the clinical process. So she shared with him that she sometimes felt suffocated in sessions because of over-talking, and that seemed to leave little, if any, room for anything else to happen. She recalled that he smiled again and indicated that as his feeling of suffocation increases, it turns into a ball in his throat that suffocates him. Yad worked with Amjad to uncover and recount all the moments in which he had felt suffocated. He, he shared when his wife reminded him of payments for the pathetic car he had bought, when he passed in front of his closed house in the West Bank, when his Israeli boss asked him to bring him fresh olive oil from their tree in the West Bank, when he entered the area controlled by the Palestinian Authority, another part of his own country, and he read the sign, quote, no crossing border, dangerous area. In every session after that pivotal moment, Amjad talked about the specifics of his breathing difficulties and sighed a lot as he did so. At this point, her supervisor indicated abruptly that it was time for Yad to terminate Amjad's treatment because she was happy with the achievement he had made and felt, and that there was no further growth or depth to explore. Yohad remembered feeling shocked and very upset about this decision, especially as she had just started to experience an important affective shift in the room. Because in the moment she felt she did not have the power to do otherwise, she initially followed her supervisor's advice and told Amjad that they needed to move to termination. She recounted how Amjad, in this moment when she shared with him that they had to terminate, exploded, shouting in a way she could have never previously imagined. While yelling, Amjad told her she was weak and she was, quote, not the one who owns the decision or the decision-making process, accusing her of, quote, not really being concerned with taking care of or protecting sick people. Yoad remembers being shocked by the fact that he was screaming and that she did not fully understand at first what was happening in the moment, nor did she have the space to reflect fully about her countertransference, but in that moment knew internally she felt very happy. After this moment, Yoad made the decision to continue Amjad's treatment alone without consulting her supervisor any further. While in future sessions, they did not explicitly talk about Amjad's outburst, she noted that she had started to feel that he had become taller as if his stature had gotten bigger. During this phase of treatment, Amjad started talking about anger. 
More specifically, he spoke about getting angry inside his car, the lousy car in which he crossed the Kalendia checkpoint twice a day, once on his way to work and once on his way back. Amjad reported getting angry in his car when he read the word Mabar, which is translated into checkpoint crossing on a sign. He reported feeling anger because he did not feel like he was just crossing from one area to another. Rather, he felt that he was inside one space, but was prohibited from free movement in another while standing at a checkpoint. Why do they call it a crossing? Yad recalls him asking her angrily. This is a checkpoint, a hajiz, a checkpoint, a checkpoint. In a session soon after he began, began to uncover his anger, Yuad reminded him that they'd not spoken about the ball in his throat for quite some time now, inquiring where it was and if it remained a symptom for him. She recalled Amjad stating, quote, sometimes I feel that there is a hate or hatefulness in my throat and not a ball. This is when she decided to ask him who he hated, to which he responded, I hate myself. After a moment of silence, Yoad said Amjad opened up about an incident that had happened two years prior. He reported taking his seven-year-old daughter in the morning with him on his way to work as she'd wanted to meet with a friend in Jerusalem. He remembered that his daughter was very happy that morning as she'd been fantasizing about this magical day with her friend for quite some time. He recalled that she wore a beautiful new dress the night before out of excitement and put flowers in her hair the morning they set out. Amjad further shared that his daughter was singing throughout the trip in the car, bouncy, bouncy, bouncy ball, bouncy, bouncy over the wall. When they reached the Kalendia checkpoint, Amjad was surprised to see tear gas and a confrontation between the occupation army and protesters. Worried about his daughter, he tried to reverse but his car was stuck in the midst of hundreds of cars, all trapped, motionless. The situation was increasingly frightful for a quarter of an hour, after which it completely calmed down. But the occupation soldiers closed the checkpoint and prevented the cars from moving. Amjad recalled that his daughter had begun to cry uncontrollably during this time and that he was hugging her, trying to calm her and contain her fear. Eventually, she told her father she needed to use the bathroom. Amjad was not convinced that they'd, allow, they'd be allowed access to a bathroom, but got out of his car to inquire as his daughter's crying was escalating and he could tell she was in considerable discomfort. Amjad told Yaad that he waved down a soldier telling him, quote, my daughter needs a bathroom. Instead of responding to him, the soldiers ran towards him with their weapons raised. And he says, I raised my hands towards the sky and shouted at them. She wants a bathroom. Please let me pass. The settler soldiers yelled, get back in your car, get back, get in the car, tell your daughter to piss herself in the car. All the while, his daughter continued to cry, Baba, Baba, I need a bathroom. Amjad recalled getting back in his car, hugging his daughter, and with a trembling voice telling her, do it here, Baba, do it quietly here in the car. He remembered how at that moment, his daughter's screaming stopped as the smell of urine spread in the car. Amjad looked at his daughter and found her shedding silent tears. He hugged her as he drove them home. And as he looked at the checkpoint gate, he remembered the cheerful song of his daughter at the beginning of the day, bouncy, bouncy over the wall. We are not you, Taba, ball, after which he immediately felt a ball stuck in his throat. Yad remembered how Amjad finished describing the incident and witnessed tears flowing down his cheeks for the first time. She remembered tears rolling down her own cheeks as well, as she also became aware of a wheel in her throat as they ended the session. Just gonna take a moment. <clears throat> This case is important for many reasons, <clears throat> not the least of which is the distilling of the banality of violence enacted daily on Palestinians, whether patients or clinicians or children. Yad tells us that Amjad's treatment was done was one that I will never forget ever in my life. 
she confides in us saying, I often remember Amjad. It guides me professionally and privately. It changed me in the way that I practice forever. The effect of this case on Ya'ad is what we focus on here and in our book. It encapsulates the condition of the Palestinian as an extension into the clinical and the clinical into the personal and social. But more specifically, it allows us an opportunity to acknowledge how Palestinian clinicians refuse to erase the signs of Zionist settler colonialism embodied in the clinical space, both in the therapist and the patient, no matter the systemic pressure or the demands from supervisors, for example, to reduce Palestinians primarily into behavioral beings with no depth and interiority. In a depoliticized condition, one might say that Amjad's psychological symptoms are experienced physically without any medical basis. The Israeli supervisor identifies the symptom as a conversion symptom, as a symptom of an anxiety disorder. She sees him primarily as a resistant patient who refuses to speak, to articulate thoughts, or to open up and be honest. We call this ideological misattunement that saturates psychoanalytic thought, analysis, and treatment. An inability to identify processes precisely became, became, because the analyst or clinician is implicated by and imbricated in the ideological matrix in which the patient is also entangled. This exemplifies what we have termed psychoanalytic innocence. Psychoanalytic innocence works in concert with the logic of settler colonialism and occupation, denying the everyday violence enacted on Palestinians and conveniently forgetting how this is also structured by the unconscious. Deployed in this way, psychoanalytic innocence is particularly insidious because it simultaneously forfeits psychoanalysis supposition of unconscious process and structure while also ignoring material reality. Psychoanalytic innocence pervades the ideological position of the practice, the theory, and therefore the relational space of psychoanalysis. To bring it back to our talk today, if following Fanon and others, we understand psychoanalysis as being primarily a method yeah. of practice of reading, organizing, and translating the unconscious individually as well as collectively and socially, and I would add politically, then the mechanics of psycholytic innocence work to at once obfuscate this process and insist on the fact that the obfuscation is not happening. That is, it maintains innocence. This process is not individual or individualized, but rather structural and is a constitutive piece of theory and practice deployed to preserve psychoanalytic practice as is, and in this case, especially in a settler colony, which by the way, we also practice in a settler colony. Here, I would also like to draw our attention to how liberal and humanistic psychoanalysis, just like Ali was reminding us, maintains this naturalization, remaining complicit through forms of oppression by seeking to graft a universalized, healthy adaptability onto colonial and racialized subjects whose humanity and psychic interiority are negated. In a liberalized version of psychoanalytic theory, these colonial subjects are only able to access empathy when they occupy the position of victim and surrender their rights to experience political and material realities in full alignment with their experience and social context. Yoad's supervisor attempts to mobilize psychoanalytic innocence. And like all of the Palestinian clinicians alongside whom we learned, Yoad was a willful subject engaging in the politics of refusal. A Palestinian clinician unwilling to succumb to the colonial violence inflicted on her as a clinician and taking her ethical stance further, refusing the violence done onto her patient, Amjad. A Palestinian clinician insisting on indigenous Palestinian presence, even in the face of settler aggression that insists on erasing the native. To the Israeli settler, in this case, a supervisor, Amjad's silence could only be a defense, a deflection from confronting the unconscious. Without attending to the structural and material realities of his world as a Palestinian, she reads his symptoms as just nerves that can be medicated. If we were to collude with psychoanalytic innocence, we might mistake the supervisor's racist and colonial aggression as a disaggregated singular act of random violence rather than an essential part of a coordinated system of violence, oppression, and erasure perpetrated 
by the settler state of Israel, here manifesting in supervisory space, in supervisory psychoanalytic space, which is why it concerns us. In this way, Yad also alerts us to the importance of the Palestinian body, individually and collectively, as a site of violence, as well as a site of resistance and sociability. The som somatization, therefore, is not a symptom of a disorder. Rather, it's a symptom of functioning within the reality principle that stops up the flow of the unconscious, the social and the intersubjective. His symptom, confronted and read through the context of pal Palestinian intersubjectivity, does not only direct us to the settler colonial condition, but also makes us consider how the occupation may manifest, manifest itself, or perhaps can only manifest itself within the context of Palestinian masculinity here, for example, through som somatizing, otherwise it might be dismissed or minimalized. There is no place for a Palestinian speaking subject in the settler colonial regime. Therefore, the suffocating ball itself is not only the symptom, something which Yad recognized, because she could see this as a Palestinian colonial subject clinician. The symptoms were illegible to the ideologically misattuned Israeli supervisor. So as Yad sees it, the ideological misattunement makes it so that the supervisor doesn't. The symptom of silence and empty speech signified the loss of the ability to speak deeply in Yad's language, to articulate meaning, as well as the blockage to affectively express the damage inflicted on the interior self by the daily violence of occupation. We can then understand Yad's decision to continue working with Amjad, despite her supervisor indicating she couldn't, as a liberatory and ethical imperative that most movingly disrupts the settler's insistence on futurity. Instead, in making this decision, Yad demonstrates that she saw his symptoms as a hajiz, a checkpoint, a barrier, just as he did, just as we do in the everyday life of Palestinians, as our clinician colleagues tell us. In this way, she actively disrupts settler colonial logics and insists on indigenous presence. Thank you.